Chapter Five of the Valley of the Giants. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Valley of the Giants by Peter B. Kine. Chapter Five. No man is infallible, and in planning his logging operations in the San Hedrin watershed, John Cardigan presently made the discovery that he had erred in judgment. That season, from May to November, his woods crew put thirty million feet of logs into the Sanhedrin River, while the mill sawed on a reserve supply of logs taken from the last of the old choppings adjacent to Squaw Creek. That year, however, the rainfall in the Sanhedrin country was fifty percent less than normal, and by the first of May of the following year, Cardigan's woods crew had succeeded in driving slightly less than half of the cut of the preceding year to the boom on tidewater at the mouth of the river. "'Unless the Lord'll give us a lot more water in the river,' the woods boss McTavish complained, "'I do not see how I'm to keep the mill running.' He was taking John Cardigan up the river bank and explaining the situation. "'The heavy butt logs have sunk to the bottom.' he continued. With a normal head of water, the lads'll move em, but with the weed drappy we have the new—' He threw up his ham-like hands despairingly. Three days later a cloudburst filled the river to the brim. It came at night and swept the river clean of Cardigan's clear logs. An army of juggernauts they swept down on the boiling torrent to tidewater, reaching the bay shortly after the tide had commenced to ebb. Now a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and a log boom is a chaplet of a small logs, linked end to end by means of short chains. Hence, when the vanguard of logs on the lip of that flood reached the log boom, the impetus of the charge was too great to be resisted. Straight through the weakest link in this boom, the huge saw logs crashed and out over into Humboldt Bay to the broad Pacific. With the ebb tide, some of them came back, while others, caught in cross currents, bobbed about the bay all night and finally beached at widely scattered points. Out of the fifteen million feet of logs, less than three million feet were salvaged, and this task in itself was an expensive operation. John Cardigan received the news calmly. "'Thank God we don't have a cloud burst more than once in ten years,' he remarked to his manager. "'However, that is often enough, considering the high cost of this one. Those logs were worth eight dollars a thousand feet, board measure, in the mill pond, and I suppose we've lost a hundred thousand dollars worth.' He turned from the manager and walked away through the drying yard up the main street of Sequoia, and on into the second-growth timber at the edge of the town. Presently he emerged on the old, decaying skid road, and continued on through his logged-over lands, across the little divide, and down into the quarter section of green timber he had told McTavish not to cut. Once in the Valley of the Giants, he followed a well-worn footpath to the little amphitheater, and where the sunlight filtered through like a halo and fell on a plain little white marble monument, he paused and sat down on the now almost decayed sugar-pine windfall. "'I've come for a little comfort, sweetheart,' he murmured to her who slept beneath the stone. Then he leaned back against a redwood tree, removed his hat, and closed his eyes, holding his great gray head the while a little to one side in a listening attitude. Long he sat there, a great time-bitten devotee at the shrine of his comfort, and presently the harried look left his strong, kind face and was replaced by a little prescient smile, the sort of smile worn by one who through bitter years has sought something very, very precious and has at length discovered it. End of chapter 5 Recording by Roger Moline